Okay, let's continue with our study of continuous groups. We'll begin in a different place. We'll begin with the manifold that represents our group. That is, it will be called, we'll call it X, and this represents that entire set. So every little point in here represents an element of X. Now, X is a group, right? And it is also a manifold. So addressing the idea of being a manifold first, we know, therefore, that every little section of X can be mapped into some Cartesian uh, space, R eta, where eta is the dimensionality of these mappings. And they're all, they all have to have the same dimensionality, but every region can be mapped into its own R eta. And importantly, if regions overlap, well, let's see, I'm using dotted lines now, but if a region overlaps, say, then that overlap area, the region that overlaps, it can be mapped in two different ways. It can be mapped to Rn through the red mapping and to another Rn through, say, the green mapping. And the whole point there is that once you do that, it must be possible to map directly from the two Rn's to each other. This is all basic manifold stuff. And as a result of all of this, what we know is that we can apply coordinates to the space X. Now, when we talk about coordinates to the space X, I could, for example, just draw the coordinates right on the space, which is a bit misleading because what I really mean is that I am taking, what it really this means is you take a point in the space, you map it to R eta, then there's a point in R eta, and it's the coordinates of that point in R eta, A, B, C, D, in this case, I guess eta is four, right? And that is the actual coordinate. But what I do is I take the coordinate lines here, right, whatever those coordinate lines are, and I map them back onto the space, and that's what these lines really are. And then I call these the coordinates, right? But it's really just a, a, a way of easily saying that I can put coordinates on this thing. So what I'll do is I'll just sort of say, for simplicity, I'll just put this little coordinate grid here saying that we have the alpha coordinate and the beta coordinate, and there's eta of these coordinates, right? However, whatever the dimension of the manifold is, presumably, I'll just, to remind us, I guess I'll throw it down here, it's going to be R eta. All of these little mappings are going to go to R eta. I don't think I use phi. I think I use psi for these mappings. Okay, so we have the manifold structure on the set S, X, but X is also a group, right? It's a group. So that means that any point in the manifold and any other point in the manifold can be combined with a group operation to give us another point. So if this was the point if the first one was the point A and the second one was the point B, then this is the point A, B. And possibly over here, that's the point B, A. Say this was a non-commutative manifold and those are different points. So what's, this is really an interesting thing, right? This is, a, to, uh, this is a, uh, a topological structure called a manifold. A manifold is topological because here in Rn, these mappings, these mappings psi, have to be isomorphisms, right? So that means in, isomorphisms are bijective, continuous in both directions. So psi inverse exists and is, and psi inverse takes open sets in Rn, which are the, uh, which for which of which a basis is the open balls, for example, and it graphs those, it maps those open sets back to open sets in the manifold. So whatever the topology is of the manifold, um, its open sets must be the inverse images or the pre-images of our simple straight up open sets in Rn. And this allows us to create open neighborhoods around any two points. And then once we do that, now is the big kicker, right? We can now talk about this mapping that takes x Cartesian product x and goes back to x. That's the group operation, right? The group operation takes two points in the group and gives you another point in the group. And you would 
you know, remember X Cartesian X is uh, one element of the group, say A, and another element A. This is an element of the Cartesian product, and we're mapping that element of the Cartesian product back into the group X, and that's the um, and that resulting point will be a point we call A B, right? Notice this kind of this is all sort of that interesting notation. This thing A comma B, that is an element of X Cartesian product X, which is a different set from X. But this is the set we're going to use to sort of symbolically talk about taking two elements in X and getting an element AB. We've done this many, many times before. This is sort of notation that helps us identify how maps work. But the point is, is I can create a little open set around A and a little open set around B. And what I'm now demanding is that uh, the, the neighborhood of AB is such that if I, instead of taking B, I take some other element of the neighborhood of B and some other element of the neighborhood of A, the product of those two is going to end up in the neighborhood of AB. And that's because the, that, that insisting on that means that the group operation is a continuous function, right? Or a function continuous, as I've written it here. So the... Um, so that means this mapping here is a continuous function from x cross x into x. And so now the topology of x is such that the group operation is a continuous function. And also the other function that's continuous is if I take a and over here is a inverse, the mapping from a to a inverse is also a continuous function, which means that I can find a neighborhood around A inverse, that if I stay in the neighborhood of A, I will ultimately land in the same neighborhood of A inverse. I can, this can always be done. And so that is ultimately what makes a continuous group. A continuous group has the topology of a manifold. And when I say the topology of a manifold, I'm certainly talking about the mappings existing to Rn. That's the definition of a manifold, but it's also taking the topology of Rn sort of pushing that topology onto the set. The, being a manifold sort of forces a topology on this set. And then I make sure that the group operation, this group operation is continuous with respect to that topology, the topology inherited by being a manifold. And this operation of inversion is also uh, a continuous operation. And that's what gives us our continuous group. All right, so let's go back to basics. Here's our, now this is the little symbology. This is sort of the diagram I'm gonna use for the continuous group. Here's X, and to remind you that it's a manifold, I'm gonna create this little arrow to our N, eta, and eta is the dimensionality of the manifold. So now, on top of this, on top of all of this, we have another fact. Not only are the individual elements in X, these points in X, right, not only um, are they members of a group such that, you know, you can multiply two together and get a third and all of that. There's another thing that these X's are doing. If I take an element of X, say I took that out and looked at it really closely, what I would see is we're interested in elements of X that are a matrix. And more, than, more importantly than that, it's a matrix that has a specific function. And that function is to take an element of an underlying vector space, which I'll call V, that has a dimensionality N, and some basis, E mu, over some field F with an inner product, right? That's a vector space that's floating around out there. I should be able to take a member of that vector space and represent it, say, as a column vector, and then I can get this product and this product will be another member of the vector space. So what's interesting is the elements in this manifold, which are a group, are also use, util, you can also utilize them to change the basis of this vector space to a new set of basis vectors. So all the, these basis vectors here would line up here. I multiply by this matrix, which I just pull out of the group, and any point out of the group can do this, and then I end up with a new set of basis vectors, which um, are still members of this vector space, but we're going to say they change the basis of the vector space. That's how Gilmore does it. Gilmore likes to say the members 
of this continuous group come out and change the basis of this vector space. And as I pointed out before, we now have several notions of dimensionality. We have the dimensionality of the underlying vector space, which I think I will uh, make a little better N there. We have the dimensionality of the underlying field of the vector space, which is either one for a real vector space, two for a continuous vector space, and four for a quaternionic, uh, well, essentially a quaternionic uh, module or over, uh, over um, or a quaternionic module, but we'll call it a vector space for now. I mean, what the heck? It's a linear space, right? So it's either one, two, or four, and that's the dimensionality of the underlying field or skew field. Then we have, in addition to that, we have the dimensionality eta, which I call the degrees of freedom when we studied this earlier. And that's the dimensionality of this thing, right? That is the dimensionality of elements in, well, it's the dimensionality of the manifold, which means every spot in this uh, manifold can be given coordinates. And those coordinates, there's got to be eta of them. So there's you know, eta slots, there's got to be eta slots here. Uh, that's not doing a good job drawing it. There's got to be eta of these slots for each coordinate. So this coordinate point is going to have uh, the coordinate, say, alpha 1, alpha 2, dot, 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 to alpha eta. And you can always do that because it's a manifold. So now you have to understand, well, the part that is a little confusing that I am repeating here from a previous lecture, I think, is that, well, this matrix, it has to be n by n, right? It has to be an n by n matrix because the underlying vector space is n-dimensional. And in order for a matrix to multiply a vector, they have to match in dimensions. So you have an n by n matrix, but you only have eight de degrees of freedom, which basically the degrees of freedom are telling you the relationship between these elements. And despite the fact you have n squared elements available to you, they're not all independent. In fact, you only have eta independent parameters to generate n squared elements. And we counted eta for several different isometry groups, and we called it the degree of freedom. And that degree of freedom is going to reassert itself as the dimensionality of the topological manifold. And these topological manifolds, this is going to be the isometry group. The isometry group, the classical groups, are going to be given this, are, are going to be given a, a manifold structure and uh, the dimensionality. We counted the dimensionality of each of those in a previous lecture. And now I just want to lay bare all of these different dimensions. You have this dimensionality here, this sort of underlying vector space, which we call the carrier space. We have the dimensionality of its field, which is probably the least most ref the least referred to of all of this. Then we have the dimensionality of the actual isometry group, which we counted um, uh, in previous lecture. And that was all driven by what? It was driven by the inner product that was established here, right? Remember, by um, uh, bilinear, antilinear, or, or sesquilinear, that is what ultimately, well, this dimension here and the bilinearity, antilinearity, uh, the different symmetries of this inner product, that's what ultimately gave us our count for eta. And that's ultimately the number of degrees of freedom. And this is our manifold. So this is basically a continuous group of transformations of a vector space. And in a lot of different books, I don't think... Uh, uh, Gilmore actually does it. They call this, this thing, a continuous group of transformations. The continuous part is the manifold structure. The, well, I, I, it's a combination of things, right? The manifold structure allows the group operations to be continuous. So that's what the continuous group part is. The of transformation part means that every element of this group is actually a transformation matrix of some other vector space. So because of this, we now have a couple different actual maps out there, and we need to be able to write all of them down because the next thing Gilmore does is it just, he just runs right into the 
key mathematics of, uh, of, of Lie groups. So let's have a look at all of these maps and write them down. The, the first ones I'll mention are these maps here, psi, the maps that are inherent to the definition of the manifold, psi and psi inverse. We're not going to talk about those maps very much at all. Those maps get buried in the fact that every point in the manifold can be given coordinates. So from now on, we're just going to assume every point has a coordinate. And inside that assumption is all of this mapping. So this mapping, we pay lip service to, but once we decide this is a manifold, we now can speak of every point as though it has coordinates. So that's the first set of mappings, and we probably won't ever need to discuss them much again. All right, so the first mapping is the one we, t we talked about uh, in our last lecture. Phi is x Cartesian x to x, and that is the group operation. So the group operation will be mapped with phi. And a typical usage for phi will be something like this. The muth coordinate of the result of this mapping as a function of alpha and beta. So alpha goes here and beta goes here, and presumably alpha and beta are, two, well, presumably, no, it's not presumably, it's certain. Alpha and beta are two elements of the isometry group. And see up here I wrote down coordinates for, say, alpha. Alpha would have alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way through alpha eta coordinates. So all those coordinates show up here. Beta, same thing, beta 1 through beta eta. There's eta coordinates inside the manifold, right, because you're going into Rn. And uh, the muth coordinate is a function of the coordinates of the two points. So obviously, these numbers here identify one point in the isometry group. These numbers here identify the second. And this function identifies the location of the product, right? And this is, and you're going to have mu of these, right? This is going to go from, say, mu 1, and then you're going to do it for not mu, phi 1, phi 2, all the way. And how many are there? There's going to be eta because the, this point AB is inside the isometry group. So it has eta coordinates just like anybody else. So that's the first important map, which is phi. Now the second map, Gilmore uses the letter F. And the letter F, or the, the F mapping, takes an element of the isometry group and an element of the vector space and returns another element of the vector space. That's this thing here. That's the, the element of the group is a transformation on a carrier space or the vector and gives back another vector. That's this process right here. And likewise, now F is an, F will give us a, an element inside this space. So the, so the resultant object has N dimensions. So the way this map is, has, has to be written is f, the ith component of f, where now we're talking about the component in the basis that makes up this vector space, is given by, well, you need an element of the isometry group, right? So that's given by an eta coordinate, eta coordinates, alpha 1 through alpha eta, but then this guy is given by n coordinates to identify a particular set of basis vectors over here, um, which I'll just call v. I'll just say it's an arbitrary vector in v. Remember, there's that question of, in Gilmore, we treat these as linear transformations of the basis. You could also just say they're transformations of arbitrary vectors as well. But you still need n. So now the dimensionality of the underlying vector space shows up in this function. And how many of these guys are, are there? i. Well, the result of this function is also a vector. So there's going to be n of these. So you're going to have f1, you're going to have f, f1, f2, dot, 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 all the way to f capital N, where this dimensionality is now what matters. Okay, so that's the second really big important function of all of this. And we're going to use these two functions. Actually, you know, I could say yi, the resulting, the ith component of the resulting vector here, where I call this vector y, and this vector was x. So that's x, that's y. So the ith component of y is equal to f superscript i, 
which is given as a function of the matrix you're using, which is identified by eta coordinates because this matrix lives inside X, which is a eta dimensional manifold, right? And uh, some vector V, right? So we're gonna use these two functions. These two functions are going to uh, drive our entire understanding of Lie groups. Now what's important is they're both, con uh, this is a continuous function, right, by the way we've designed everything. This, the way X is a continuous group, and by definition, in a continuous group, the group operation must be a continuous function. So we've got that assumed. Um, but uh, this function here is also understood to be continuous. So we can use regular calculus for all of these things because all of these functions are designed to be well behaved. Okay, so now let's let's get real comfortable with these functions because we're going to use them a lot in the next couple lectures. So this first thing here is the muth component or the muth coordinate of the product of a b is given by this expression, right? It's the muth coordinate of this phi a b. So I could write this as phi alpha, I shouldn't say a b, alpha beta equals gamma, where alpha beta and gamma are elements of x. What I'm actually now writing, when I, when I express it this way, alpha and beta are simply elements of the isometry group, and I'm talking about closure, right? This is closure because gamma is an element of x, and gamma is the product of alpha and beta. So what, in, in pure group language, it would be alpha beta equals the group element gamma. So the group product of alpha and beta is gamma, and of course gamma is in the group because it's a group, right? I mean, it has to be. It's, groups are closed. But in the function form, in the function form, we're now looking at it this way. And this is a, this guy here is a actual real number function of, of two eta real variables. Because remember, this now is shorthand for alpha 1, alpha 2, dot, 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 alpha eta, and this is shorthand for beta 1, beta 2, dot, 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 beta eta. So there's two eta variables jammed in there, and this final result is a single real number, and there needs to be eta different functions like this, phi 1, phi 2, dot, 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 to phi eta. And therefore, there's, phi, there's a eta of those because gamma ultimately needs to be expressed as gamma 1, dot, 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 to gamma eta, right? So it's very, very important to be able to look at this and think of a real, a, a, a two eta, uh, a, a real function of, of a real, let's see, how do I say it? A real function of two eta real variables. And why is everything real? Well, it's because it's a manifold. And manifolds are always dealing with R eta. So this manifold has to have real coordinates, real valued coordinates. There are such things as complex manifolds that go to C eta, right? But we're not playing with that. We're not playing with that. That's like string theory crap, right? We're not doing that. So um, let me erase some of this. So the big point of this is we're taking group operations and turning them into real number functions. I mean, real, va real valued functions that are just real numbers in and real numbers out. And that re reflects these group operations. And they're also continuous functions in the simple, straightforward sense of calculus, meaning you could do an epsilon delta proof on this guy and get... Uh, uh, continuity out of it because that's now how everything is structured. Everything's designed that way. We're going to uh, set up an example for ourselves in a moment. But closure can be expressed using these functions. What about associativity? Well, in regular group language, if I take alpha, gamma, alpha, and beta, and I multiply them together, and if I first combine alpha and beta and then gamma, I should get the same thing as combining gamma and alpha and beta. So now I want to convert it to this kind of language. And here I think I've got it. I think I've done it. 
I'm saying now that if I take alpha and beta and I use the group operation, which is defined by this function phi, and I take, whoops, you know, I don't have it right. I don't want the new there, right? I don't want the new there. And I combine those, and then I combine it with, then I use phi again, and I combine it with uh, gamma. I should get the same result as if I combine it with, get, combine gamma and alpha first, and then combine it with beta. Now notice the way the coordinates are coming in and out of this thing. Here, it's totally abstract. In here, when I write gamma, I am actually implying that I mean all of the coordinates. Because remember, this guy's a real function, right? When I write it phi with a, uh, with a, uh, a superscript mu, I'm now talking about a real number answer. If I left the mu off, I wouldn't mean a real number answer. I would mean a whole uh, list of coordinates. But with the mu in there, I mean that this guy here is a real number. But when I have no coordinates in there, uh, or no superscript in there, I'm talking about really all of the coordinates. So I can replace this with a list of all the coordinates. Likewise, this can be replaced with phi 1 of alpha beta phi 2. I know I've said this a couple times, but I just, I feel the need, every time I feel the need to say it, I'm going to say it. And my redundancy is just, I'm never worried about being redundant. Because like I said, there's no time limit on my lectures, right? This isn't a university where I have to give you a, a, an exam in the middle of next week, so I have to keep it concise. You know, if I feel like saying it again, I'm going to say it again. So the replacement for this is actually a list of coordinates here. This here is shorthand for a long list of coordinates. Each of these would be separated by a comma, right? And then even this is shorthand for phi 1 of alpha 1 dot 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 alpha alpha eta beta 1 dot 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 beta eta, right? So ultimately, this is all shorthand for coordinates. And the reason this is important is when we study the calculus of this, I'm going to use this shorthand all the time. So in your mind, you got to realize we're always talking about real arguments, real numbers go in here. But this is shorthand for eta real numbers. This is shorthand for eta real numbers. And then even when I write the shorthand, there's also shorthand in it for an additional eta real numbers and eta real numbers, right? Anyway, this is how you write down the associativity, right? The associativity, uh, this is a real number on the left and this is a real number on the right. So this equality is all real numbers. Now what happens if I wanted to cut the short pan even further, right? I can make the shorthand, I can go like extreme shorthand here, right? And what I can do is I can actually erase the mu here and the mu here. And now the left hand side is that shorthand for phi 1 to phi um, eta, right? And that has to equal phi 1 dot 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 comma phi eta. Where now I've converted the left and right hand side into an eta tuple, right? An eta tuple on both sides. And they have to be equal element by element, right? That's what happens if I eliminate the superscript. Now I'm not dealing with a real number, I'm dealing with a whole element of r eta, right? Uh, I don't think I don't think we'll be doing that. I think we'll almost always uh, keep ourselves with the uh, eta up here. So we're dealing with a real number equals a real number. Then there's uh, the, an easy one is the identity, right? The muth component of the identity, which we use as epsilon. For some reason, epsilon is the identity in this story, meaning epsilon is an element of the isometry space, which equals obviously one, 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 one all along the diagonal, right? So what we're saying now is that, um, uh, so, okay, this is a good point actually though. Epsilon is this matrix, right? But that matrix is still given coordinates, right? So there is still an epsilon one dot, 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 epsilon, oops epsilon eta, right? There's still 
eta coordinates for this matrix element. And generally speaking, I, you know, if, if we put this in the center of the coordinate system, right? Meaning if, if, if eta, if the, if epsilon is the identity element and it's given coordinates, those coordinates may be say zero, 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 dot, 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 zero. Maybe those coordinates are one, 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 right? It depends on the coordinate system we choose to put on X, right? The coordinates of the identity don't necessarily have to be zeros and ones, right? The coordinates just have to be such that when we reference those coordinates inside the group, we end up with um, the matrix that is, in fact, the identity matrix, right? So that's an important point. But, um, but just note how this is done, is that the mu coordinate of the product of the identity element with alpha is alpha mu, right? It's the mu component of alpha. That means you're going to return, you put in the coordinates of alpha here, you're going to get the coordinates of alpha back out one at a time. Uh, and you have to put in the coordinates of the identity. Likewise, this also shows that it's commutative, right? Alpha and epsilon commute. Notice we've done associativity. We didn't do commutivity because generally speaking, uh, these are not commutative things. And uh, likewise, you can reconstruct this for the inverse, meaning that the, the group product of a group element and its inverse will give you the coordinates of the identity matrix, right? Because remember, coordinates go here, coordinates go there. And we get the mu coordinate of the product of alpha with its inverse. It better be, you better start generating the coordinates of the identity. And then, of course, I guess, I guess I should write this also to show you have commu commutivity between the inverse uh, and the original element. Meaning, meaning, the inverse of an inverse is always going to be uh, the original element. So now we have the same idea for this other key function, the function f, which you remember f is the is this transformation. We're take, considering each element of our asymmetry group as a transformation on the vector space, that's expressed through this function f. Uh, so you need a isometry group element or a continuous group element and an element of the vector space, which is often called the carrier space, by the way. And the result has to be an element in the carrier space. So closure in this story means that this product always lands back in that vector space. So here's this function in full unshorthand form, which in a slightly shorthanded form would look like this, uh, fi alpha v. And now we understand that alpha is an element of the isometry group and v is an element of the underlying vector space, capital V. And this is still a real number, right? Well, actually, in this case, it's not necessarily a real number. It's an element of the underlying field F, right? So in principle, this could be, this guy here could be a real number, or it could, it could be a real number. It could be a complex number, or it could be a quaternionic number, depending on uh, the nature of this underlying vector space, right? This guy here, uh, could be any one of those three. So that's an important point. So so now I no longer have, I, I, un, unlike in this circumstance where I can always say phi mu is a real number and, or not phi mu, gamma mu is a real number and gamma itself is always going to be represented by eta real numbers, gamma without a superscript. Now I can't say that. I have to say, why i is some element of this field. It could be real, complex, or quaternionic. Anyway, so closure just means that uh, y is a, uh, that the y i are all coordinates of a new vector in the vector space. That's what closure is in this, with this function, right? Right, we often think of closure as like an element of a group you take two elements of a group and you get an element of the group. So closure, it's like all of this is, is within G. We're kind of thinking about closure now as we've got an element of a group, we have an element of a vector space, and we get back an element of a vector space. So we're basically saying that this group is, is keeping vectors and giving us vectors, and we're going to call that closure. So now we want to look at a notion of associativity, right? So if I have alpha and beta, which are elements of our isometry group, and I have V, 
which is an element of our underlying carrier space V, I want to be able to say, let's see, uh, let's do it the way Gilmore does. He does beta alpha V, right? And he says, well, I can take alpha and transform V and then take the resulting vector and use beta to transform that. Or I can, in the isometry group, I can take the group product of alpha and beta and then operate on V. And I should get the same resulting vector. Now remember, this is this here is a vector and this here is a vector. So this here is a group element and a group element times a vector, that is a vector. So you still have vector and vector, right? So so clearly the uh, the the units all work, but that's thanks to closure, right? Closure, yeah. So how do we write this in terms of our functions? Well, this one here, alpha operating on V is F of alpha on V. Now here I've lost the superscript on F because this automatically means to me it's F1 of alpha V comma F2 alpha V, etc., all the way to F capital N alpha V, where N is the dimensionality of the underlying vector space. So, and then of course I'm using shorthand again for the alphas and Vs. This should be alpha one through alpha eta and V one through V capital N for all of these, right? So everything's coordinates. And this is an element of the field, this is an element of the field, and this is a function that takes um, uh, N field elements, right? N field elements F, and it takes, what are these? eta real numbers, right? Because the coordinates of the members of the isometry group, the coordinates of this are always real numbers because it's a manifold, a real manifold. Okay, so that's shorthand So that's shorthand for this. And beta is shorthand for, of course, I've said it before, it's shorthand for beta. Was I using subscripts or superscripts for those things? Um, subscripts. Sometimes I use superscripts, sometimes I use subscripts. It doesn't matter in this case. This isn't general relativity where those things are really, really, really a big deal. So, I'll, so but this is beta one through beta eta. That's what belongs there. And this is the ith component of this vector. And then if I did it on the right-hand side, it looks very different. First, the this product, beta alpha, is phi beta alpha, right, which is shorthand for the eta coordinates, the eta coordinates of the group product of the two group elements, beta and alpha, right? And then I multiply that by the vector v, right? Well, how do I do that? Well, that's fi of that group element times the vector v, right? So. Notice this is kind of interesting, right? On the um, on this side, you have two uses of the function f, and here you have a use of the function f once, but then a use of the function phi. But this is what we mean by associativity um, regarding the transformation side of things, right? Regarding this, this structure is associative in this sense, and then lastly, uh, the inverses are. Pre, the identity in the inverse, you know, fi, if I take the identity element of the isometry group, operate on, uh, on a vector v, I better get back the vector v, so, right? So I better get vi. And likewise, there's inverses here, right? So if I take the, let's see, if I take the alpha inverse uh, operating on alpha x, then the way I would write that down in um, in all of this notation is I have the this is a, right this is a vector right well it better be x itself but uh, well let's see hold on I should be able to write the inverse down as f i of alpha inverse operating on f of alpha operating on a vector v and that had better be uh, v i, something like that, right? Um, but of course, by associativity, right? This is going to be f i 
of phi alpha inverse alpha on V, which has to be VI. And then of course, this thing here by our previous identity has to be epsilon. So this becomes FI of the identity on V, which has to equal VI, which is what this says. So, you know, basically these, you get the facility understanding these functions is really important. And I will remind you that um, this number here is real complex or quaternionic, right? So FI returns a real or complex quaternionic or quaternionic number, but phi always returns a real, the coord, any given coordinate uh, of phi, any mu phi, this will always be a real number, a real number. So we've kind of explored this again. We've gone a little bit deeper into the notion of how we write down all of these important group properties using functions. And we understand the domain and range of the functions, right? We understand that these will give you real components. These will give you components inside the field of the vector. This represents the fact that each member of the isometry group is a transformation on the underlying vector space. This tells you that each member of the isometry group is a group, right? This is the group operation that defines the group, right? And we understand that in the background is this really critical concept that kind of disappears once we get used to referring to every element of the group with its coordinates, its eta coordinates. And the eta coordinates are the degrees of freedom of that group, which we counted in a previous lesson. But that degrees of freedom is different than the dimensionality of the matrix in this group. And what we're going to learn is we're going to learn not only is that the case, but we can take, we can create different dimensionalities of representations that will always have eta parameters, but this matrix will be, we can, we can design these parameters to return matrices of almost arbitrary dimension, not quite, but almost arbitrary dimensionality. Um, and uh, we can boost the dimension of the vector space. And by boosting the dimension of the vector space, we'll need a, a different dimension matrix, but it'll still be the same isometry group. And all that is called representation theory. Don't worry about that quite yet. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it when we need to, and we will need to, because that's what makes this all work with particle physics is representation theory. But to understand the representation theory that's important to particle physics, you've got to be really solid really solid on these dimensions, the dimension of the underlying vector space, the dimension of the manifold of the isometry group that preserves the metric of the underlying vector space, and then uh, the notion of the fact that this here is takes its value in the field of the vector space. Um, uh, this, well, the components ultimately of this function take their values in the field of the vector space. This guy here, right, is going to be a vector in the vector space, the way I've literally written it here. And uh, this guy here is uh, the group operation. The components of this group operation, you know, that's the, when I put this mu up there, those are always real numbers. Okay, so um, in our next lesson, we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna do a full example of this that Gilmore does. It's actually a lovely little example, very, very, simple example that sort of takes all of this and gives, uh, gives it a little bit of uh, solidity. Okay, see you next time.